Hi, so what we are going to be talking about today is what shapes an ecosystem. So there's two terms that you need to know to start off with, biotic factors and abiotic. Uh, the word bio means life, so the prefix bio is life, and biotic factors are living factors. They're living things that affect the ecosystem, so like the number of trees in an area or like the number of fish. So if you look here, we have the Mississippi River. And so you have rocks and you have water and you have cattails over here. And here's a bunch of um, trees. And there's more trees and sand. So in this picture here, a biotic factor would be anything living or something that was once living and now dead. So like a dead log in the middle of this river would be a biotic factor because that's going to be a habitat for plenty of animals to live in. So biotic factors affect a living factor. So uh, the grass, the trees, the cattails, um, any fish, so like this catfish that would be swimming in the Mississippi, that would be a biotic factor. An abiotic factor, if you put the letter A in front of a word, it means the opposite. So prefix bio means life, biotic factor, living factor. Put A in front of that, abiotic factor. So now that's a non-living factor. So that's anything non-living that's going to affect an ecosystem. So that could be like the temperature of the water, the temperature of the air, the cloud cover, the sand over here, the soil competition, competition, the soil, um, I can't think of the word, the word, um, the, anyways, soil, uh, let's see the rocks here, the number of rocks, the, how fast the wind is blowing. All of those are abiotic factors because none of them are living or ever were living. And they um, affect the ecosystem because the uh, wind speed determines what type of plants can take root or how deep the roots have to go. Uh, the temperature of the water determines what type of fish can live there. The number of rocks to determine how much sediment can go into the water. So all of those things. And speaking of living things that affect an ecosystem, I was mowing lawn the other day. And um, I got trapped underneath the lawnmower because that, I had that big thing. That's We have a big, huge lawn, so we have that lawn tractor. And I had that big, huge thing on the back, and it, like, hit the branch of this tree. And I like, didn't notice, so I kept going. And then all of a sudden, this tree branch, see how big my hands are? It was this big. Of, oh, my gosh, it was so big, like, that big around. And, like, pinned me. So I was, like, laying down. You didn't see me. I was laying down, like, vertically horizontally I mean because it was vertical and I was leaning down horizontally and I was trapped and I couldn't shut, up, shut it off and so I was like ah. and my husband was on the tractor so he can like save me and my kids are like oh I'm playing so they had no idea and so I was like oh my gosh I had to like Lamaze breathe like stay calm because I was trapped and I tra couldn't jimmy out oh my gosh it was so scary so that was a biotic factor that then fell off the tree but it's still affecting a living e ecosystem me like because I'm not an ecosystem but it affected me so then I tried to jimmy my foot to shut the lawnmower off. It wouldn't shut off. And then finally I, swung, I got the like branches of my hair. And oh my gosh. So I went and got my 10 roll. And we pulled really hard to get that branch off the lawnmower. Oh my gosh. So the abiotic factor would be, you know, the the soil. Soil type. Composition. That's not like a soil composition. Uh, the soil type. Um, but the biotic factor in that situation would be that tree. And the fact is, now it's killing me. No big deal. Okay, so your book also talks about levels of organization. It starts with a specific species. This is my favorite picture ever. I went to the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. That's where this picture is from. And I got to eat breakfast, like, right here. So I was, like, right here, and I could take this picture. It looks like it's Africa. We'll say it's Africa because then there's more species. Okay, so see this one giraffe right here. His name is Frank. Let's say Frank. He's one specific organism, one species. So then Frank has some buddies, right? They're all BFFs. There's my mouse. Here we go. So all of the um, giraffes in this area, all the giraffes in this area would be a population. Now the giraffes live in the area, and then there's like antelope up on this hill over here. There's some, there's a cheetah, there's a rhino over here. So all of those different species together would be a community. And then call the trees here and the rocks down here and the sand, that's an ecosystem. Living and non-living, abiotic and biotic things, and then the whole world's a biosphere. So, and I threw these flamingos on there because that's a crazy population. You could do it there, but then that's all you can see is the flamingos. So one species would be one flamingo, and then a whole bunch of flamingo population. And if we had other birds in there or other animals, it'd be community, and then the living and non-living things together would be an ecosystem. And again, the whole thing's a biosphere. So that's how the world is organized. So that's kind of cool. All right, a niche. This is a really big part, um, definition that your book gives, but I like to think the niche is like your habitat, 
or I'm sorry, the niche is like your job. So like a squirrel, I have a bee here. So you could talk about a bee. Uh, but so I like to talk about squirrels because they're fun. So you have the squirrel here, right? And it wakes up and it lives at 101 Oak Tree. That's where its address is. So its address is its habitat. Its habitat is 101 Oak Tree. That's where it goes every day to sleep and hang out and whatever and hide from its friends. Or its enemies, I should say. Okay. But its niche is its job. So what does that squirrel do up every day? So it wakes up in the morning and then it's like, mm, I'm thirsty. I'm going to run down to this river. I'm going to get something to drink. Oh, I'm going to grab some nuts. I'm going to take him to 101 Oak Tree. Oh, okay. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to chase this, this dog around in circles that's tied up. Oh, that's boring. Okay. Now I'm going to go gather some more nuts. Okay. Now I'm going to go over here and drink. Now I'm going to go up here and run away from this dog that's chasing me. Got loose. Ah. And now I'm going to go up in this. So whatever it does all day long, that is its niche. Okay. It's a full range of physical and biological conditions and the way it lives. So your niche is you get up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you take a shower, you eat breakfast, you go to school, you go to your sports, you go to your job, you eat supper, like whatever you do, that's your niche. And then your habitat would be, oh, 301 East Brown Street, wherever you live. So that's that. And here's bees. So this would be its habitat. That's where it lives. And its niche is to go collect honey. No, it doesn't collect honey. It makes it. it goes and collects nectar and brings it back, and then it makes the honey. All right, we have the word terrestrial and we have the words aquatic. Terrestrial ecosystems are located on land, like a forest of meadow or rotting logs. Those are all terrestrial. So, like this back here, this forest here would be a terrestrial ecosystem. This lake here would be aquatic. So, a forest is terrestrial because terrestrial means land meadows um any like a log we had this bike trail by our school and if you just see this huge or any forest you go to there's a big rotting log that can be a terrestrial ecosystem because if you look at it um there's like bugs in there and slugs and mushrooms and centipedes and all these things living in that log so that's their own little ecosystem aquatic ecosystem can be marine or freshwater freshwater would be like this lake here this would be, this is off the coast of Florida. That's where the manatees are. They're so cute. Oh my gosh, I love that. Manatees. Um, so they can be fresh, salt water, or salt water. Salt water is marine. Oceans and estuaries make up 70% of their surface. And then um, fresh water would be lakes, rivers, and creeks and stuff like that. So this would be fresh water here. So these are two different types of ecosystems. And then um, your book, last main thing that this section of your book talks about are community interactions. So you have something called symbiosis, bio, life, sim, like similar. So they live together. Two species live together um, in some type of relationship. And they're talking about animals. They're not talking about humans. So in animals or plants or whatever, it, they don't have a negative. So if you notice here, I have these pluses and zeros. You're probably like, what the heck is that? So these are the three different types of symbiosis. You have mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. Okay, mutualism is where they both benefit. Get it? That's mutual. If you're in, um, if you're mutually in like a relationship or something, you both benefit. So a mutualistic relationship, plus plus. That's what the plus plus is for. Like a bee and a flower. A bee is like, yes, then the flower is giving me nectar. I'm gonna go make honey. Ooh, this is actually, I think, a wasp. So. Um, the flower then gets pollinated because the pollen sticks to this part of the bee and, or the wasp. And then the next flower goes to, then the pollen falls off and then that flower gets pollinated. So the flower gets um, to reproduce and make more flowers. Yay! And then the bee gets nectar so it can make honey. Yay! So that's that plus plus. They both benefit. Commensalism, on the other hand, is plus zero. One benefits and the other one's like, eh. Whatever, it doesn't, it isn't affected whatsoever. So my favorite example is right here. This is a whale. This is a gray whale. And these are barnacles. Barnacles are crustaceans that live on the back of gray whales, for example, or other whales. And they filter the water of food. That's how they get their food is they're, they're filter feeders. So I don't know if you know anything about gray whales. They're amazing. I love them. They are off the coast of California all the way up to Alaska. They migrate. Like they're the longest migrating animal. Um aquatic animal they migrate 12,000 miles anyways they have skin and they have blubber right so it's like this thick they can't feel that barnacle they have no idea that barnacle is there and so that would be the zero the mm, I don't know is there and then the plus would be the barnacle because they get a free ride they get constant supply of food because it's constantly going through the water so that's pretty cool that's commensalism and then parasitism, I think you probably understand what parasitism is. It's some type, sort of parasite. So that's plus, again. 
and then minus. Parasitism, obviously the plus would be the parasite because they get a place to live and the minus is the host because uh -uh, that's not fun. So an example is tapeworm. This is tapeworm right here in a dog. So tapeworm, they live in the intestines of dogs or humans if you happen to eat food that has tapeworm in it. And then they attach, they have hooks and suckers that attach onto your intestine. And then when you eat, they, <laughs> your food is already digested or not digested, broken down, right? So it's just this liquid this liquid and the parasites like score and then they absorb it and then that's how they get their nutrients is through your already broken down food and then you as a host if you have one for a long time if you you got one like as a human you might get sick or you could um like lose a lot of weight because they're taking all your nutrients and you're not getting very many of them same with the dog and so a good parasite do you think a good parasite kills its host because what happens if the parasite kills its host <laughs> And the parasite dies, right? So a good parasite doesn't kill its host. But sometimes they forget and they reproduce and there's just too many. Um, and then they kill their host. So tapeworms and dogs are examples of that. So notice in nature, there's at least one plus in every relationship. Mutualism plus plus. Mentalism plus eh, whatever. I don't know you're there. And parasitism plus minus. So that is in nature. Those are all symbiosis. Those are community interactions. So it's kind of cool. If you Google symbiosis or any of these topics, you'll see like there's tons of examples. It's pretty cool. The last thing I'm going to talk about is predation. It's really obvious. Predator prey. They can have a huge significant um, in the population. The most common one, if you look in any biology book ever, it talks about the lynx and the hare. There's the Canadian lynx and then the snowshoe hare. And when the lynx population goes up, the snowshoe hare population goes down. And then the snowshoe hare, because they're their favorite food, which they eat like almost all the time. So lynx is up, snowshoe hare is down, snowshoe hare is down. So what's going to happen to the lynx population? There's not enough hare, so then they die off, right? Oh, there's not a lot of lynx. Oh, what's going to happen to the hare? Burp, they go back up. Oh, there's a lot of hare, so it's going to have lynx. There's like that graph. It's so well known because that, I mean, most other species eat a, a variety of different foods. So, I mean, think about what you all eat in a day. Do you eat the same thing for supper every single night for two years straight? Probably not. Whereas the lynx is like, mm, I like snowshoe hair. That's what I'm going to eat. Uh, I don't want to get anything else. Mm, oh, I guess we're going to die then of starvation. Oh, <laughs> that's what they like to eat. And so it's crazy how predator prey goes like that. In most cases, it's not as extreme like that because, like I said, they will adapt and they'll eat something else. So this is just a brief introduction of um, ecosystems and what your general biology book talks about. Let me know if you have any questions. Bye.